So we've seen how um, we can set and get the status of various properties on datasets and Z pools. Um, and what I'm going to do now is to show one in more detail, which is compression, the compression property on datasets. Now the compression works in, I wouldn't say a strange way, but perhaps not in a way that you'd expect. Um, with compression on a data set, ZFS looks at the data and decides whether it's going to store the data compressed or uncompressed. Um, it's quite involved and it has a bearing on the size of the blocks that are stored on the disk. So if you're into tuning and you want to get the best possible performance and compression out of ZFS, you might want to read up um, some more information about this. But basically the important thing to know is that if the compression engine can compress data very well, it will store the data uh, compressed um, and therefore obviously take up less space. If it can't store it very well, you know, there's obviously an upper limit or if it's, you know, virtually uncompressible, it won't bother um, storing it compressed in any way. So you will you will never get the situation um, where, I don't know if you've ever tried, if you've tried um, compressing a file that's already compressed or maybe like a video file that's already highly compressed, um, what can happen is either you end up with a file that's no different in size or the file may actually increase in size because of the overhead of actually compressing the file i.e. the actual additional metadata about the compression and so on. Um, ZFS doesn't do this, it, it's more intelligent than that. Um, so as I say, for a, a file that compresses very well, it will um, store the compressed representation of that file, or the data rather, rather than file, um, within the blocks. So you could have a file that's partially well compressed and partially not very well compressed. Um, and part of that um, part of that file will be stored in ZFS uh, as a compressed uh, data block because it compresses very well. The part that doesn't compress very well will just be stored as it is because it doesn't st uh, compress very well. There's even more to it than that. Um, if the data um, is just zeros then the data is not actually stored. It's like a um, sparse file is or a sparse block is created on the disk. So there's virtually no space taken up whatsoever um, with a file that is just um, zeros. So that's worth bearing in mind. I, I can only guess that the point of that is is for things like databases where you know maybe they've created. Um, huge data sets that are just full of nothing, i.e. zeros. Um, so they take up very little space on a ZFS uh, file system. And obviously as you allocate data, you know, maybe textual data, that will, that would compress very well. So it wouldn't be a sparse file or block anymore. It would actually be compressed data. So what I'm going to do is to remove my dev STA links. Okay, so I'll do Z pool create test and it's a mirror and STB and I'll avoid SDC and go for SDD and I'll create a data set two. Uh, don't forget to put the command in so that the program knows what we want it to do. And then I'll make my user the owner of that directory. Okay, so if I do ZFS get compression 
for test test obviously it's off by default um i have read somewhere i don't know if it's authoritative or not um but i have read that they're thinking about making compression default to on when you create um the pool and data sets and the reason being the current data compression algorithm we've got which is called lz4 is extremely good it's um very fast and it compresses very well so it's a good trade-off between the two of speed and um compressibility um and i would say i've, I've read this the same what about what i'm about to say i've read on the internet so i can vouch for it i've um experienced it myself that it does work extremely well and I would say there's no reason to have compression off. I've I've had data sets with compression off um, for several years and data sets with compression on and by far the ones with the compression on um, far far better storage. There's some data you'd think wouldn't get much compression out of it and you do eke out, you know, five or ten percent compression out of, you know, as I say, stuff like videos or um, files you think wouldn't be very compressible. So, um, especially on modern machines which are fast, you're not going to notice any slowdown. It's it's only a, a small overhead in terms of CPU to compress and decompress the data. Um, the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages of um, uh, having compression turned off compared to, or turned on rather compared to turned off. So um, generally what I do if I create a new pool, which is very rarely, um, I'll turn compression on. Um, even older pools that I've got where um, compression was not the same algorithm, was a little bit slower, a little bit less efficient. Um, I've now turned them on, turned on the compression so that all the new data sets do use it by default. So for that reason, I'm going to set the compression on at the pool level and if you remember when I say at the pool level is the data set that comes free with the pool when you create the pool that we don't normally use but this is the point where we can set global settings for all the data sets or the default settings for all the data sets on the um, on the pool so set compression to on for the test pool and as you can see, although we've created the data set test on the pool test, um, and it's obviously defaulted to compression off because that's the default of the pool data set, when we set this, um, sorry, this would be ZFS, shouldn't it? When we set this uh, property, when we get the compression for the actual data set that we've used, it's actually switched on because it's inherited it by default and if we didn't want that we would have to override it explicitly as I showed previously. So we've got compression on, we've checked it's on and now what I'm going to do is I'll go to my normal user and I'm going to go to the directory in question I've just created the data set. So you can see it's empty and I'm just going to do a quick DD um, and copy some zeros into a file. Oops. Quick big file dot zeros and I'll copy, let's copy one gigabyte. I'll just wait for that bell oh, count equals one. Just wait for that to run. And you can see that was extremely quick for one gigabyte. Um, yeah, it's, it's done it. In fact, I'll probably do a... Um, Another one would say 10 gigabyte and things that was so quick. I'll call it big file two. All oh, right, okay, yes, of course, 
I've got enough memory, so I'll do count 10. So I'll just wait for that to create. And if you did a Z pool I asked that while it's doing this, you'll probably find that the um, date throughput is quite low because, as I said, what it's doing with zeros, it's creating effectively sparse blocks. There's no real, in fact, it looks like it's taking longer. Oh, it did take longer than I thought it would do. Let me do it again and I'll do the Z pool IO stat so we can see the actual throughput. So you can see it's writing at a rate of 580k per second. It's jumped up to 650 there. Roughly 550 transactions or operations per second. Well, it's getting, it's actually getting quicker now. It's dropping off, so maybe it's finished now. Yeah, it's dropped right down. So yes, it has finished, and it. So despite the fact that ZFS was only processing in the region of six. 600k or so, you can see DD was seeing a throughput of um, nearly half a gigabyte per second. So you can see there's there's an anomaly there. You can see what 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 ZFS is doing. It's it's doing like I said, we're sending it gallons of data, but it's saying, oh, you're sending me loads of zeros. I don't need to store those zeros. I just put some markers in saying they are zeros, and that's why there's very little. Um, space been taken up there. So if I do ZFS list you can see that we've only used a total of 25 kilobytes on the whole of the test um, data set. If we do DF minus H you can see that's only telling us that we've used 128k. If we go and do an LS minus LH on the directory itself you can see we've actually got 11 gigabytes inside this directory so that shows that some sort of sparse file system or sparse file storage is is being used by ZFS and that's uh, just a peculiar case for zeros it doesn't work for any other run of um, um, uh, uh, numbers so it won't work for ones or twos or threes or whatever um, it's just for zeros and I can actually prove that if I do um, oh actually something else I can show you if I do Z pool list no sorry not Z pool list ZFS get compress ratio which is another property get the compress ratio for test this is also showing, oh no, sorry, it's not test, is it? Test, track test. This is also showing um, a compression ratio of one, as if there's no compression, and yet we've got an incredible amount of compression. It's probably, you know, a thousand times. So that there's another anomaly there that um, we know we've created big files because LS tells us they're big files, but the compression ratio is as if there's no compression whatsoever. And also, when we look at the um, DF minus H, and when we do ZFS list, it shows us as if there's no data on there. So it's worth bearing in mind if you're using compression that not all is what it seems to be. So you might think, um, oh, I want to copy this file over, it's only 100 megabytes. You copy it onto another file system that doesn't use compression, or you're sending it down a slow link. And you think, oh, why is it taking so long? And it's because that file, although it's only 100 meg on, on disk, it's actually, you know, 10 terabytes or something ridiculous like that. Um, you know, a, a file just full of zeros. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to use this uh, Java utility that I've written just for this demonstration to um, create just random files. Um, I'm going to use it to, oh, what am I doing, Java, I'm going to use it to create a file, so we've created a file full of zeros, and I can actually um, create, let's do a 
another big file let's just do one full of zero so I'm going to create another file full of zeros using a different a different tool let's take a little bit longer I think it's not too bad okay so there's the file it's just under a gigabyte this time but again if I go back to the root do the same things as I've done before you can see again um, you know the sizes that are being reported oh sorry not said pool list ZFS list are as if nothing's been written to the to the data set and the df minus h again that that's not changed there at all so now if i write a file which has got um all the bits set so i'm just going to write ffs to 255 values to all the bytes in the file so i've done another huge file and this might take a little bit longer because it's not creating a sparse file this time it is actually compressing the uh, um, data so now if I do ls-l you can see this one with the ffs it's approximately two gigabytes yeah it's just under two gigabytes so now let's have a look at the stats for this so dfsh you can see it's gone up to 15 megs so that two gigabyte file it's just a continuous run of ones binary digit ones so that's compressed really well down to 15 meg do a ZFS list you can see that concurs with DFS uh, DF minus H just just under 15 megabytes and lastly if we do the compression ratio you can see now it's now it's actually giving a, a compression ratio because it is actually compressing stuff arguably sparse sparse blocks sparse files aren't compressed data they're they're a representation of data if you like um, so maybe that's why they haven't set this or maybe it would be some astronomical value in the, you know in the order of thousands or millions that it, it would just be pointless to, to display it but here we've got a compression ratio of 128 almost so for every 128 bits if you like one bit is being stored effectively that's the ratio so you can see the the um, algorithms intelligently deciding how it's going to store our data it's seen the zeros it knows that means empty just store a sparse block it's seen a run of ones now and it thinks ah, oh, I can compress them really well I'll store them as compressed data and that's why we've now got this um, actual compression so now I'm going to do uh, some different data let's do some ASCII um, so I'll do one file again do a big file um, one of them and we'll just do principal 7-bit data so this this will take a little bit longer than before now because it's um just random data it's not a run of uh repetitive numbers so this will take a little little while and i'll just monitor this in the other screen i think Okay, so it's done about half a megabyte. Uh, sorry, half a gigabyte. Let's just give it a little while longer. Just so that we're actually creating something useful. So there's a uh, gigabyte. So, all right, it's finished there anyway, so that's okay. So if we do ls minus lh, we can see, yeah, it's 929 megabytes for that text file. So that's seven bit binaries. Uh, sorry, 7-bit ASCII that's been created there. So if we look at the stats again, you can see this has dropped right down now. It's still extremely good. It's still, you know, three times um, the space that's uh, being saved. So it's, you know, it's still really high compression because it is just basic text. 
um, we can do a ZFS list and you can see we've now stored about a gigabyte of data but when we look at the totals because of these highly compressible files and sparse files we're actually running at about 15 gigabytes roughly so it's still an incredible ratio and we'll do df minus h and again that that ties up with what zfs list shows us and for i won't bother doing the 8 bit um ask uh, 7 uh yeah sorry that was printable ascii sorry yeah um i'm not going to bother with the full 7 bit ascii i'll just go straight for the random bytes um so that will be 5 and you'll see that the compression ratio will drop even more now because it's just random bytes it's going to be less compressible um, so if I do the list you can see the, oops, not the list. compression ratio has now dropped from nearly three times to only two times so for every bit that's um, every two bits that of data we've got it's managing to squeeze it the information into one bit and you can see it's dropping even further now despite that the random data would still achieve a, a compressible ratio it just might not be as fantastic as we've seen it might be 1.01 or 1.1 something like that um, and when you're talking about huge arrays of disks huge pools um, that can still represent gigabytes possibly even terabytes of data that you're saving um, depending on the size of your pool, looks like it's settling down to about just over one and a half times while it's yeah it's finished out. So that's the final compression ratio. So you can see it's beneficial. This is, as I say, it's an old Pentium. It's um, I don't know, approximately ten years old, twelve years old. The machine. Um, it's it's the um, last of the Pentium line with sixty-four bit capability. So it's it's really quite old and it's able to create some you know fairly large files on on again quite old discs you know they're about uh probably eight to ten years old maybe the discs on old technology pci interfaces old old interface cards and so on and it's still able to get quite good performance um, even though it's having to compress data and you know do a lot of work so it's it's definitely worth having and there you can see the um, compressed file there, that data one. Um, as I said before, if I now turned the compression off, these files would remain compressed, but any new files would not be compressed, and therefore the overall compression ratio would reduce even further because the new data that's being stored is not being compressed. Um, and then likewise, if I turned it back on again, that file that had been written to uncompressed would remain uncompressed until either I start writing to it and certain blocks would be updated or I just copied it and renamed it maybe. Then the copy would be compressed and you know the original would, be, would remain uncompressed until it was deleted. Um... What I should do now, just one other demonstration of the um, compression ratio. I'm going to remove these. So they're obviously moved, removed really quickly because most of that data was sparse data. So I've got the compression ratio now, it's back to one. What I'm going to do is just do a copy of you know, actual real world stuff. I'm going to copy the user directory back here. Um, now this might copy the whole lot because um, this is a mirror of the bigger drives, 1.5 terabyte drives. So this could well finish um, while I'm talking about this. But I'll cop get that copying and we'll just look at the compression ratio. So this is real stuff. This is binaries and files and libraries so on that's being copied. You can see it's already achieving a good compression ratio from the outset. We've also we've already got um, over twice um, the amount of space uh, that we would have had due to compression. It's dropping slightly now, um, 
but you can see it's um, for, for real world stuff, you know, stuff that's in the user directory that everybody would have on the Linux machine. Um, you can see the advantage of just, just that data being compressed. Again, remember df-h shows the size used by the compressed blocks. So the ZFS is returning us the used space in its database, um, not the actual size of the files. So we may have copied a gigabyte of data now, um, but it's only actually showing you know, 428 megs. So at two times, uh, multiply that by 2.2. .2, if that's the current ratio, and it is roughly a gigabyte that's been copied, the copied but it's only being stored as 400 megabytes or so. So yeah, the, the ratios settle down to about 2.2. So that's just a, a real world example, if you like, of you know how the compression uh, can be so beneficial and it's not a synthetic data files that I'm creating. So I'm still copying, I'm going to stop it there. Um, if I did um, do on the user directory, just see how big it really is. Okay, so it's four gig. So what I might do is I'm going to copy this again. I'll leave it running and um, come back when it's finished running and we'll just see if that 2.2 compression ratio has stood um, again like I say because this is generating real programs and data um, just to get an idea of how good this compression is and while it's running I'll just monitor the um, processors you can see that overall roughly a third of the processor time is being used on the copy command and the uh, ZFS programs so there's this one here it's probably I don't know, something like ZPool or ZFS write issue and it's about a third of the processing capability so it's not too onerous and obviously on a new machine with more cores and faster processor this would be negligible it, you know it might be no, two, two to five percent maybe, but obviously on this older machine, it's it's taking more more resources away. But even then, it's still um, fairly minimal considering what it's doing. So yeah, I'll just um, wait for that to complete and come back when it's done. So that's finished copying over now. So. Um, I'll do du minus sh on the test test directory. Okay, so it's 1.9 gigabytes. I guess the df minus h will show similar. Yeah, 1.8 gigabytes there. And the compression ratio, which is what I'm particularly interested in. Um, there, it's just over two times so the data is roughly taking up half the space it would have done if the data wasn't compressed and that concurs with what we saw before where the size of the original data set original data is um, I think it was just over four gigabytes so we've got it down to just under two gigabytes so there you go so you can see it's um on real real data that's that's quite efficient <laughs>